Welcome to the Presbyterian Church in Westfield. We are glad to have you with us. This is the last week of a summer worship series that has been exploring how we live our lives. We're reflecting on scripture passages that you know, encourage and even challenge us to live out our faith in the world. If you're like me, so many of us, we're eager to get back to normal, to get back in the game. Sometimes we stand up, we look around at our lives and go, how did I get here? Well, if that describes you, you're in luck this week. Sarah Benedetti, our new associate pastor for children, youth, and families, will be sharing some wisdom as she reflects on the literature of Proverbs. We'll also be celebrating the Lord's Supper today, so be sure to have some bread and some fruit of the vine ready. Now join us as we get back in the game. Morning. Our scripture passage today is from the book of Proverbs, verse chapter 24, verses 30 through 34. It says, I passed by the field of one who was lazy, 
by the vineyard of a stupid person. It was all overgrown with thorns, and the ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed warrior. So what makes a stupid person? When I was growing up, I was always taught that you're not supposed to call people stupid. And then lo and behold, here in our scripture today, someone is being called a stupid person. When I was little and I would say that about someone or even something, I'd get in trouble. And uh, that's extended into my adult life, actually. I was hanging out with my friend Sam and her two girls and called something stupid, can't even remember what. And my little three-year-old niece looked me right in the eye and she said, we don't say that in this house. And I, I had gotten schooled by a little, by a little three-year-old. And so when I saw it in this, in this passage today, I was kind of like, wow, that's, that's kind of harsh. But when I looked up the actual meaning of the Hebrew words, it means lacking in understanding. And that kind of changes your perspective about the person in question, this person who's let their vineyard, you know, go to seed and become overrun. So knowing that it means lacking of understanding, it, you have to adjust the expectations. And so we see ourselves in this person where maybe something in our lives that we've let go to seed or get overgrown or haven't been tending well, we have to adjust our expectations because it's not that someone's being foolish or actually stupid. It's maybe the fact that they just don't know how to do what they need to be doing. And so you, you have to start where you are, where you are with these, with these types of things. For example, me trying to keep my house clean, terrible at it. I, I, I like to blame it right now on the fact that I just moved in and there's still boxes everywhere, but Truth be told, I've always been kind of a, not, well, not even kind of, I'm a terrible housekeeper. Nothing's dirty. There's nothing growing or anything, but, but my house, house cleaning is, is never been the best. Uh, as compared to my friend, Megan, her house is immaculate. I have no idea how she does it. She's a mom. She has three kids. She's got a dog, several cats, and her husband is in the Navy. So half the time when he's, you know, out on the submarine, She's a single parent and yet her house is just always immaculate. And I've always wanted my house to be that way. But unfortunately for me, it's kind of always been that way. My room was always a mess as a kid. I just never really got into that uh, rhythm of how to keep my house clean. And so I decided kind of during the pandemic that I wanted to change that. I wanted to, to try and get my house clean because during the pandemic, as, as I'm sure happened with, with a lot of you, you know, you're not going out and everything. So things around the house kind of pile up maybe. Um, also I had left my job at the church, so I wasn't working. So there really wasn't a lot of motivation to, you know, clear that stack of papers or do that load of laundry because I can wear those sweatpants again. That's okay. So my apartment got really, really messy. And when I finally made the choice that I wanted to keep it clean, I, I was just so overwhelmed. There was so much to do. Every single room needed work. And for me, it was like going from being a total couch potato to trying to run a marathon. It's not a good idea. It's super stressful. You get overwhelmed and you end up just giving up. And the, what you have to do in that situation is, is take tiny steps and be proud of those steps. And so I was, I was talking with my therapist about it and um, you know, I was like, okay, so I made a list and I was reading this list to her. I was like, clean the kitchen, vacuum the carpets, uh, reorganize the closets. And she was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Those, those lists are too big and too broad. You know, instead of clean the kitchen, it needed something like clean off this one section of the counter and take out that one, you know, bin of recycling and put away those, you know, five or six dis dishes that are sitting in the in the drying rack that have been there for several days. You have to take those small steps um, and, and be proud of yourself when, when you do them. Because whether it's, it's choosing to do something good or better in your life or choosing to stop doing something negative, 
switching direction, it, it has to start small. Um, and like I said, those, those changes can go in both ways. But that field, that, that field of that stupid person, um, that person who is lacking understanding, it didn't get that way overnight. We make choices to do those small things. You know, if whatever the vice is in life that, that we indulge in or the thing that we shouldn't be doing, whether it's drinking or drugs or deception or abandonment or, or whatever it is, those things didn't start overnight. You don't go from never having had, you know, a, a, a drink in your life to being an alcoholic in, in one day. Um, it's it's the, the small choices and over time it gets to the point of that field, whatever the field is for you, that it gets overgrown and it gets abandoned. And whoever was taking care of that field, whoever that person was, their decision that led to it being overgrown and unuseful didn't happen in one day. Um, and so I want you to think for a second about what, what that field is for you. What field of yours is maybe overgrown or what's a field that you've never even planted. Uh, think about one of those things in your life, an area that you maybe want to change or expand upon or grow in. Um, just, just think about that for a minute and consider the fact that the great thing about having that opportunity about wanting to make that change is that you can always choose to make that change. It's not a, I have to do it now or it's never going to happen. You can always make the decision, whether it's been a month that you've been thinking about it, a year, a decade, it doesn't matter. You've always got that possibility. And also if you've ever tried before and failed, you can always try again. This is something that, that people who do diets or exercise programs or something, you know, there's a set thing that they're supposed to do every day and um, they get overwhelmed with it or one day they, they don't do it. And it's so easy to just be like, well, I messed up. I failed. I'm just going to quit. But that's not how we have to look about, at it, that we always have more opportunities. We always can choose to, to make that change, to switch directions, uh, whatever day it is, whatever's happening. And I like to, to remind people who are facing that, who have that, well, we made the mistake that one time, we failed, let's just not even try, about the relationship that God had with the Israelites in the Old Testament. Now, God loved the Israelites. They were the chosen people. They were supposed to bring God's love and be an example to the world. And yet they screwed up so, so, so many times. And yet God was still there for them. They made lots of bad choices over the years. They made lots of great choices as well, but the bad choices that they make, it started small. When, when they found freedom from the Egyptians and were you know, being led to the promised land, they started small with their, with their bad choices. They, you know, complained about the food or I'm sure complained about the fact that they were in the desert, that it was hot, that it was dusty, that they didn't have, you know, solid homes to live in. They were living in tents and everything. But it started out with those small little complainings and then wound up with things like them worshiping the golden calf. But it wasn't, they crossed the Red Sea, they had freedom, they were so thankful and then the next day they're worshiping the golden calf. It was these small choices along the way. And yet God still loved them. God still stood by them. And it continues all throughout the Old Testament where the Israelites keep making these not so great choices and God keeps taking them back. I did a, a Sunday school series with my middle schoolers a few years back, and uh, we went through the book of Judges, which if you've never read the book of Judges, go check it out. Very, very interesting, kind of violent, but middle schoolers kind of dug that. So uh, we went with it, but we, we went through most of the book and it got to the point where at the end, I would be able to ask them, what is the theme of the book of Judges? And they would all say in unison, and once again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, because over and over and over, they did. They, they would be going along fine. Maybe it was five years, 10, 20 years, even 80 years, but then they'd start making some not great choices and they'd screw up and they would suffer. And yet God was always there to take them back no matter what. 
And so I want you guys to think, what is that field that came to your mind earlier that you want to tend, that you want to get back to making useful and making uh, plentiful and purposeful, or that field that you've never gotten around to start planting and, and make beautiful and have something additional in your life. And one of the parts of, of Christian life is learning to make those steps, to make those choices, to um, explore new areas of life. But sometimes it's hard because it's like, well, I don't know where to start. So let me give you a few steps um, that I think would be helpful in looking at uh, tending a field that has been abandoned for a while or starting to plant a new field. First, acknowledge the change that you want. Whether it's like with me, the um, having my apartment cleaner or, you know, could be running a marathon. That's not what I'm choosing, but uh, maybe that is for you. Or it's, uh, you know, eating healthier or spending more time reading the Bible or praying with your kids, whatever it is, whether it's leaving a bad situation or starting a, a new good habit, say out loud, um, you know, this is what I actually want to do. Then once you've decided on that, you need to set realistic goals for yourself. Um, celebrate them when you meet them, even if they're small. Like for me, my apartment eventually got cleaned. I mean, I did move, so I had to clean it before I moved out, but it started to get cleaner, but it was small steps. And remember that that change is not going to happen overnight, but don't be discouraged about it. Um, because guess what? Next one is you have to be kind to yourself because you're probably going to have a few slips or obstacles or maybe even royally screw up in this new endeavor that you're trying to do or returning to something that you had done previously. But be gentle with yourself. You're, you're starting a new habit. You're starting a new way of living. Think about what you would say to one of your friends if they were starting something new and they came to you and they're like, oh, I was just, I screwed up. I'm a horrible person. I, I can't believe I was so dumb to do that. Think about what you would say to your friend. You wouldn't turn to them and say, well, yeah, you're a failure. You might as well give up. You got to think about that in talking to yourself and be kind to yourself in, in this new thing that you're trying to do. The fourth one is share with other people what you're doing whether it's the choice that you've made or the steps that you're taking or the you know small little uh, goals that you've achieved, because that means that people can help hold you accountable. They can check in with you and see how things are going. They can also give you encouragement. And you never know, you might be an inspiration to someone else to start tending a new field themselves. Um, you never know how you might influence someone else. And lastly, rejoice in your accomplishments and reward yourself. Um, you know, obviously you don't want to indulge in a behavior that you're trying to, to get out of, but if it's, you know, you're taking up running, you know, buy yourself a new pair of running shoes. Um, you know, get yourself that, uh, you know, those wireless earbuds or whatever, so you can listen to music or podcasts or books on tape when you run. Um, but be kind to yourself and, and be happy when you do meet those goals, however small, however big they are, um, rejoice that, that you've made a choice to start tending that field again or, or start a new uh, field. And then ultimately, keep setting goals. Um, we have to keep moving forward in our Christian life. It's something that is, we do it every day. It's, it's one choice. It's one action. It's one thought. It's one time of prayer. It's one service project that we go and help out with at church. But it's part of being in community. It's a choice that we make every day. And even if we haven't been happy with how things have been in the past, that doesn't mean that we can't change it moving forward. Because that's what faith is supposed to be. Um, it's not a one-time decision and then you're done and good to go forever. It's growing in that relationship and having that faith influence who you are and how you live your life. Amen.
know, whether you are a first-time guest to our worship or a long-term member of this church, whether you're part of the group that worships online live every single week or finds us on one of the platforms for a more timeless connection, you belong right here. Welcome home. You know, whenever we pray, which we'll be doing so in just a moment as part of communion, we encourage everyone involved to share what is you know, weighing on them and weighing down on their spirits so that we can make your prayers our prayers. And you can do this by adding the concerns into the comments section on whatever pl uh, platform it is that you found us. Now, to prepare ourselves to celebrate communion in just a little bit, I invite everyone to join in with the prayers together at this time. Eternal God, let your Holy Spirit move, move with power in and through us. Let your Holy Spirit move over these gifts that you have given of bread and cup, that our sharing of them may be for us the communion of the body of Christ, that we may become one with him and one for each other. May his coming in glory find us always watchful in prayer, strong in the truth and our love, faithful in the breaking of bread, because we do believe that something sacred in the life that we share together is the gift you intend for this world, a world in which we long for all divisions to be healed, And we sing your praise through these little moments of worship, of collecting, and of praying together. We ask that you hear at this time the calls, the prayers of your children who are being offered up in the comments of all those worshiping today. We also ask and pray that you would offer grace, healing, and peace to all who suffer. We seal our prayers with the one that our Lord taught us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, we tell this story in different ways, but on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord, speaking to his disciples, preparing them for a time in which they would not have him, took up the bread, and having blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. Whenever you do this, do so in, remember, in remembrance of me. And in the very same way, he took up the cup. Having blessed it, he offered it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant, the new relationship with God. Whenever you do this, do so in remembrance of me. And so, friends, here at this table, we have been bound together in the love of Christ. We've been bound together in the hope, the knowledge that in Christ we have been forgiven and freed. In Christ we've been made a, a part of a larger family within God's children. But not only for our own sake, but for the sake of the world. Here as we celebrate this communion, we are promising to make our life become a gift for other people. So I invite you now, this is the body of Christ that has been broken for you. Come, take, eat. In the very same way, I offer you the cup. This is the blood of Christ that has been shed for the sins of many.
I hope that you go forward in this week and look for those fields in your life that have perhaps been overgrown and untended for a long time that you've wanted to get back to and that you're able to find ways to reconnect with God and with your faith as we go through this continually trying time. Know that wherever you are, we are here for you and that you are loved. Go in peace.